Hello everyone. Uh, we are going to speak about uh, a couple of items that we did not discuss in the last chapter, and that is basically um, discussing uh, categorical perception and the, how the, um, the perception of consonants is different uh, from the perception of vowels. And then we'll speak about the auditory as assessment of auditory functions and um, and how various categories perceive uh, uh, speech sounds. So vowels pro uh, provide us with multiple cues, and there are only fourteen vowels in the in the English language, and that leaves us with twenty nine consonants. So the uh, fact that vowels do not involve a lot of constriction and the vocal tract is virtually uh, is is open and and virtually symmetrical that makes uh, vowels easier to process and uh, they also provide multiple acoustic cues as for consonants there are a bigger category and it will be harder to distinguish between one and the other in speech and as a result they also do not provide as many cues so um as a, as a result many of these are perceived as a group of consonants like you have a group of consonants perceived as if they are the same phoneme under um, uh, certain conditions as we speak during conversation so we perceive them in a holistic manner as a as a whole as a category so in categorical perception the listeners uh, hear a series of consonants and, and they perceive them together as a cluster. For example, um, they listen for, if they listen for 10 seconds, they determine kind of uh, all the consonants that occur within the span of 10 seconds will be divided into two groups and one group will be perceived as one consonant and then, up the, then, then there will be a shift that's called crossover after the crossover then the sound that comes after or the sounds that come after will be perceived as if they are one phoneme um we are speaking about yeah you know for example uh the allophones of a k k can be produced as a neutral sound k normally and if it is followed by a uh, the e it will become re, the k becomes retracted. You say as in key. If it is followed by an u, by u, it becomes rounded. If it's followed by a, ah, it becomes kind of more kind of open. So there are different forms of these. But this is not just limited to allophones. It is actually limit. It is actually goes to uh, groups like say stops uh, together as a group. Uh, they can they are usually perceived of as one group that is voiceless stops as compared to voiced stops. So in categorical perception, the one of the cues that um, that we get is from voice onset time. And if uh, you do not recall what that is, you need to go back and to the previous uh, uh, class and look at the four categories of voice onset time and how they are different for voice consonants, voice stops uh, compared to voiceless stops. So also, <clears throat> um, in terms of the place of articulation, uh, like say bilabial stops, alveolar stops, uh, velar stops, and the glottal stop. Uh, and uh, that is uh, place of articulation applies to stops and to fricatives as well. The fricatives are nine phonemes and they are the biggest category. So in terms of place of articulation for the stops, we have a bilabial uh, stop, we have a, a t uh, alveolar, two stops, and then velar, and then um, glottal. So all of the voiceless stops will be perceived as the same phoneme under conversational conditions. And um, for example, if you have the person 
and that is experimental. If you have the person listen uh, to um, a series where you have two and then Pu, Ku, uh, these three will be perceived, uh, the Te, Pe, and Ka will be perceived as the same phoneme. So it also, categorical perception also occurs for the duration of the transitions from stops to glides. As when you move, we say B, we, if you listen to this repeatedly, you are going to perceive the B as W. <clears throat> you wouldn't be able to distinguish between them. So, um, because in B, there is a shorter, there is a voicing, of course, either before uh, or at the same time of uh, the, the, the release of the stop. When you say E, your, the vibration occurs actually before you release the stop or at the same time. When you say we, so the transition from B to we, that is going to give a, a clue as there's a change. And that will enable you to understand, for example, that the, that the next sound coming is, is different. So consonants again have, they do have multiple acoustic cues, but not as many as, uh, as vowels. So for example, the listener is going to use voice onset time and also the onset, the beginning of F1. F1, as you know, or F2 or whatever, they last for a period of time. So at the very, the very beginning that the, the F1 begins, um, what is it like? Because we are speaking about a stop, you release the stop into a, a vowel. So immediately as you release, there's a transition, of course, between the uh, format of the stop and the, the, I mean, the release, and then the, um, the vowel coming after. So, and there's a silent gap. So the, the, we use the voice onset time and also we use uh, the onset of F1 for the following vowel to decide whether the stop is voiced or voiceless. We understand that uh, the four voiceless stops have either a long lag or a short lag, but always in all conditions, the voicing for the next vowel that comes after these stops the um the voicing comes after a, a lag after the stop is released so that lag can be short lag or long lag it can last uh, maybe uh, 25 milliseconds maybe it can last up to 100 milliseconds depending on if the consonant comes at the beginning of a word or the end of a word like when you say pat versus tap so these two, the release of the stop comes, um, uh, you know, one of them is going to have a longer pause and the release is going to have a lot of air coming through that is voiceless. And um, if it, the word that, that they say the consonant at the beginning is going to be longer than the one at the end. So we look at this um, for this that is a voice stop or a voiceless stop as um uh, as a rule a low f1 onset uh, if the frequency of f1 at the beginning uh, is is low for example and uh, uh, also a shorter voice onset time that means that this is a voiceless stop so in that regard we understand that the voice onset time is shorter uh, either for voiced stops, either at the same time of the vowel of the um, the release of the stop, as in b, uh, or before the release of the stop. So a high F1 onset and a longer voice onset time are associated with voiceless stops. So that's the opposite. So the perception perception of the two groups of stops, whether voiceless, uh, voiced or voiceless overlaps if the characteristics are changed slightly. For example, just to prove it, um, if you uh, get to the voiceless stops and shorten the voice onset time and make them perceived as 
voiced under speech conditions. So, um, and the opposite, if the voice onset time uh, is, is lengthened, the two groups could be perceived as voiceless, for example. So there are other acoustic features also provide perceptual cues like duration of the following vowel, how long the vowel is when you say schwa versus e, uh, the tense vowel e, or the duration of the frequent uh, noise, for example, that, that uh, comes uh, for fricatives, for example, how long do you say s? How long do you say, uh, like when you say smile versus cats? Um, and also the duration of F1 itself. I'm, I'm sorry, the fundamental frequency, like how long the vocal folds continue vocalizing. So all of these are cues that we rely on to process uh, or to perceive consonants. Um, in terms of uh, co-articulation, that is um, with the overlapping of phonemes as the articulators work on producing multiple, um, uh, they produce two or more sounds at the same time. So there will be a lot of adjustments. Um, the uh, computer is low, so bear with me. So in terms of co-articulation, the shape of the vocal tract uh, during the production of uh, certain sounds, for example, uh, is determined by the nature and articulatory requirements of the sound that is being produced as well as the sound that is coming after, like I would say key, key, that the k becomes retracted in anticipation. So in certain cases also what the sound that comes before is going to also play a role. So consequently the vocal tract is, is being modified a lot during um, articulation. So the listeners, um, as they process, they have, they kind of take a, a span, um, a whole span of uh, of uh, speech or like a, a period of time, uh, let's say ten seconds, twenty seconds. So um, they are going to 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 scan the consonants that are close together and they cluster to them as one category and they perceive them as if they were just one one single phony. So, for example, I mean to prove this. Uh, Participants are currently uh, given as, you know, they listen to a series of uh, sounds followed by a vowel. They just to determine the effect of the vowel that comes before, especially after. But like I said, the vowel coming before also will have it, an influence. Like when it says splash versus, uh, versus pun, for example. So, but generally the, the, in these experiments, they use the sound that comes after. So they have a per syllables. They, they have s and sh, and then in the first, uh, series, they have the s followed by e, and they have sh followed by e. So, and they alternate them. So you listen, c, she, c, she, c, she, several times and then they find out that the uh, they will be perceived the person perceives them as uh, in that case she she both of them both s and sh they will be perceived as sh when they followed by the e and uh, uh, when they have these sounds s and sh followed by u and they make a series like this su shu su shu su shu and so on the listeners perceive these both as c so it just that is because of the influence of the u coming after these sounds Com uh, i'm sorry of the uh, yeah the u coming after these sounds it makes the listener somehow perceive the s and sh as the same 
So this is just to demonstrate the effect of co-articulation in that it, it does affect the perception of consonants as, as clusters or as groups. Um, a rate of speech also influences perception of consonants. For example, uh, during speech, if the, the stops, for example, uh, that uh, uh, have um, uh, intermediate, like uh, voice onset time, uh, just in the middle, intermediate, these are perceived as voiceless in fast speech. If speech is fast, then you perceive this as voiceless. Um, and they also are perceived as voiced if the speech is slow. So that also is simply to prove that the rate of speech provides uh, cues um, as to, the, to enable us to cluster you know, certain groups of consonants together and perceive them as the same consonant. So now we are going to speak about the evaluation of auditory functions and the treatment uh, of disorders related to hearing impairment. It is more about the assessment than the treatment. Uh, first, the major uh, kind of uh, divisions or, or types of hearing loss are uh, conductive, sensorineural, and mixed, three categories. So a hearing loss can be either happening in the outer ear, like pinna and ear canal, or in the middle ear affecting the tympanic membrane, the ossicles, and uh, the eustachian tube. Uh, so that is um, anything that is in the outer ear and middle ear is conductive, and it is uh, the result of middle ear, outer ear pathology or middle ear pathology. For example, swimmer's ears is a, as an inflammation of the lining of the uh, ear canal, especially uh, closer to the eardrum. Um, and the, if there's cerumen, um, ear wax accumulation, and or impacted ear wax uh, in the ear, that is also a cause for conductive hearing loss because it obstructs the transmission of the signal. Um, if there is middle ear infection, uh, for example, that is in the middle ear, that is going to cause conductive hearing loss. Another condition is autosclerosis. Uh, in that case, uh, the bone, uh, you know, how the, the stapes is flexible and it's supposed to be just going in and out based on the sound. So it docks, it is connected onto the oval window. If someone has autosclerosis, bone grows around the, the foot plate of the stapes and it, it fixates it to the Round to the oval window, so the, the, the stapes cannot move at all, and the, that person that cannot hear the, the voice or the sound cannot be transmitted into the inner ear. In terms of so conductive hearing loss, always, always is reversible, it can be fixed, and the person can get normal hearing after. Sensorineural hearing loss is reversible and it occurs in the, either in the cochlea or in the uh, vestibulocochlear nerve, especially the cochlear branch, the cochlear nerve. Um, in terms of mixed, that means that the person could have both conductive hearing loss, like they could have medial ear infections. Also, they have, in addition to that, a sensorineural hearing loss. So that is a mixed uh, and I have seen people who actually have both of them. The severity of the hearing loss, of course, is important. And keep in mind always that uh, perception, auditory perception, the only way, the only channel to build auditory perception or, or speech, language perception is, is, is hearing. So the degree to which hearing is affected is going to affect uh, the perception of speech and the development of uh, speech uh, perception. So um, normal hearing, I mean, hearing can be um, either normal or uh, the person can have a slight hearing loss. 
So you do not find the slight category in most, uh, in many places, except if they have high medical standards. Say um, in Massachusetts, for example, some areas, some places, if you have a, the hearing, uh, your hearing is 15 to 20 dB, that they look at it, yeah, it's a slight hearing loss. But in the majority of states, they take to, uh, uh, if someone has a, a hearing loss of 20 decibel to 40, that means a mild hearing loss. And from 40 decibel to 60, uh, that is moderate. And there's another category, 60 to, eight, to, um, to 80 is um, moderately severe. And from 80 to 90, that is severe. And then profound means the person has no hearing at all. So in addition, uh, there are configurations. What does, what is the pattern of the hearing loss? Remember always R is red. R is red. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, red means right ear. Uh, and then blue usually is left ear, but, but red is, is right ear. So, um, here we have at zero decibel is mostly when people are born, the perfect hearing is at this, should be at zero. Um, and the lower you go, I mean, the, the higher you go in terms of uh, a decibel, uh, as you go down, that means the worse the hearing becomes. So this person here has a hearing loss. Uh, the right ear and the left ear are just about the same. But this is not why we call this a flat uh, tympanogram. We call it flat tympanogram because, you see, the frequency is 250 uh, hertz, 500, 1000, 2004, 8. They, they tend to be almost, almost affected uh, almost on the same level. There's some variation. It's not perfectly like a, a horizontal line, but that is almost the frequencies, lower frequencies and higher frequencies are almost affected on the same level. So we call this flat. And uh, then we have another pattern where the person's hearing is worse at the low frequencies and then it rises, uh, as you rise to higher frequencies gradually, hearing becomes better and better. So that is called a rising tympanogram or a rising pattern of hearing loss. Uh, typically, the hearing loss is worse at the lower frequencies. And then as you move to uh, give them a high free sounds, they, their hearing becomes uh, gradually better. And that is the rising tympanogram. So I needed to understand the different patterns of these tympanograms, what each one means. There is uh, sloping, either gradually sloping or pre precipitously uh, sloping. Uh, these are not differentiated in your textbook, but you are going to come to find out that um, the sloping means that hearing is better at the low frequencies, but then as you go to the higher frequency sounds, the person has more difficulty, becomes harder and harder with the increasing uh, frequency. So there is, in some cases, that increase because it is not as, as abrupt. And, um, and uh, some uh, audiologists would call this gradually sloping, but in some cases, uh, there is an abrupt switch. The person will be able to hear fine, for that is that tympanogram is perfectly normal at 250, 500, 1000. But all of a sudden, when you go to higher frequencies, immediately you just have a very precipitous uh, sloping pattern or abrupt, ab abruptly sloping pattern where the high frequencies become way, way decreased. The impairment affects the higher frequencies much, much more than the lower ones. So, and now we speak about the, um, we speak about the diagnosis of hearing impairment uh, using different measurements. 
One of them is emittance audiometry, and it is used to assess uh, hearing loss uh, in uh, the outer ear and the, in the middle ear, and um, that's for to show conductive hearing problems. So there's emittance audiometry. Uh, emittance has to do with transmission. Emittance is another word for transmission, but use that term because it is what is used by audiologists. So emittance audiometry is used for identifying middle ear problems, and it measures how easily a system can, can be set into vibration by a driving force. The driving force here is a tone uh, that, is, um, by, um, that is introduced into the ear, and then it is supposed to set the uh, tympanic membrane into vibration, and the tympanic membrane should set the ossicles of the middle ear into vibration and so on. So that is what we mean by a driving force. So I think uh, emittance audiometry includes two reciprocal terms. One is impedance, the other is admittance. You want to introduce this tone. You want to see exactly how, how fast, how smoothly can that tone travel from there to the inner ear. And at the same time, you want to see if there is any impedance. To impede something is to prevent it from moving. If there's anything to resist or to oppose the flow of energy through it. So both values are in included within emittance. One of these, um, so when we look at um, the measurement tool, that is called a tympanometry tympanometry and you have a, a little machine a device you take a tip the, the the tip here has like a rubber piece attached to it when you put it into the ear it causes it creates a seal uh, so that the the air um, you know I mean the person uh, there's no air leak or anything like a perfect ear plugs um, so it, this tool is going to give you measurements about three things. It will tell you about the um, tympanometry in terms of the, uh, the eardrum function. It will tell you about uh, static acoustic middle ear admittance, how smoothly the, the sound goes into the middle ear, uh, and also the acoustic reflex. So uh, there are three configurations now. Uh, one of them is if you have type A tympanogram. Uh, type A tympanogram here, it has a single, so you have the tympanogram here. You have the pressure in milliliters. I'm sorry, the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, mil it's measured in milliliters and also in decapascals. Decapascals, this is for the pressure, and this is for the displacement. So um, the, uh, there is a zero here, and that means for the pressure, the pressure should be at zero. That is normal because you want to have the eardrum, uh, you know, in the ear canal, you should have the same pressure as in the middle ear. So the eardrum should be neutral, it should not be sucked into the ear, the, the middle ear, or it should not be pushed out into the ear canal. It should be neutral. And that is zero. So uh, the peak, when the peak is at zero here, that is normal. And um, there are the three kinds of tympanograms that will show us the function of um, of the, you know, for example. Uh, number one, the eardrum, and also the level of pressure inside or outside. So tympan uh, the type A tympanogram has a single sharp peak at, uh, at uh, uh, zero, DPA. And you look at the one in your textbook, it is more, you know, perfectly symmetrical there. But if there's any little pressure change in the middle ear, that is going to make that peak a little bit off, and it um, it will um, it will be off uh, from zero. 
So the area on the left side of the zero is negative, means there is negative pressure in the ear. The area on the right side, uh, it would mean um, that there is uh, uh, usually uh, uh, yeah, positive pressure. So, but um, in normally, in normal uh, situations, you need to, you should, it should be minus 400 uh, to plus uh, 200 decapascals. So anything in between that range that shows normal functioning. And, and again, aligns on the zero, and that means perfect. This one here <coughs> uh, doesn't perfectly align, but it is close to normal. And then type A, <coughs> type B, tympanogram, it is it shows a flat contour with no peak at all and that is a result of impacted cerumen a lot of ear wax in the in the ear canal or otitis media middle ear infection or and, and that shows there's extreme negative pressure so for example the, there's no peak at all that means there is a negative pressure here extreme negative pressure and um that will cause the flow of energy to be impeded it will be obstructed so in other words here is the middle ear here is the ear drum when there is extreme negative pressure here it, it it pulls it retracts the ear drum in and it prevents it from vibrating normally so and the other situation is type c tympanogram it has a peak However, that peak does is is on the left side of the zero, and that shows uh, there's abnormal functioning. Uh, the negative pressure it's all in the negative pressure region here, and um, um, they, that that shows that the U station tube is not functioning normally in that situation here. And the air, for example, when there is negative pressure in the ear, I mean, I'm sorry, when there is um, uh, a problem blocking the eustachian tube, making it unable to open and close when you swallow to ventilate, that means that uh, the air inside of the middle ear will be absorbed by the middle ear tissue, and that is going to cause middle ear uh, pressure to go negative. And that will um, pull uh, the tympanic membrane inward. It will cause a retracted tympanic membrane. But the important thing here is that type C uh, is associated with eustachian tube abnormality. So each one has a particular, uh, I mean, a particular kind of problem it is associated with. You need to know what each one exactly stands for and uh, to define it. Uh, tympanometry, the, in, in any condition basically that causes stiffness of the ossicular chain can reduce the energy flow through the middle ear and will result in a lower peak as, as a rule. So for example, autosclerosis it prevents os the ossicles from vibrating and that creates, yes, it creates a type A tympanogram, but it has a much lower peak. And it also 